uh, <clears throat> Lloyd Hand, King and Spalding. Most of the car manufacturers here say that are moving toward uh, hybrids, maybe flex fuel, then uh, hydrogen fuel cell and electric, uh, uh, say that they are constrained by the development of battery technology. Could you say a few more words about your battery technology? I think the, the perception today is that the Japanese are probably most advanced in the development of the uh, type of battery that they contemplate to get us to 100% electric uh, uh, driven cars. Hi, I'm George Polisner from Alo Novo. I was at Oracle for about 12 years, so I'm not surprised to see an SAP guy I feel, selling cars. I, I feel for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just curious, in, in terms of what you've said, I was recently at a conference where they uh, spoke of the huge demand and pressure uh, to deliver energy to the China, uh, the growing China infrastructure. And what I know the I idea is to basically do this clean, yeah. but they're under tremendous pressure to essentially leverage coal. So I'm interested in anything specifically that you might have in mind for the emerging China market. Okay. Two, two questions. Um, so on the hybrid hydrogen battery question, there was a big, there's, there were two problems on battery. One was safety. All right. We used lithium ion cobalt battery. The problem with cobalt is it got oxygen impurities inside. Sorry for going chemical, physical on you guys for a second. But the, the oxygen in a battery heats up, combines with lithium, and then it really heats up. And it creates a very nice burn. Don't use a cell phone if it burns, but don't use a car because it's got 3,000 of these right next to each other. So we needed, the first question was how do we get a safe battery? And a company here in the U.S., actually in Boston, Massachusetts, called A123, was one of the first ones to do a lithium battery with a different combination than cobalt. They use iron and phosphate. And the magic there is that phosphate actually absorbs oxygen faster than lithium, and so this battery cools off when it, when it gets hotter around it. And it's so safe, you can actually put it in an oven and put a, a, a cup of octane, gasoline, in the oven and turn the heat on and, and oil will burn first, self-combust first. And that battery won't even self-combust, it will just melt the caps on the sides. The aluminum will melt before the battery will do anything. That's what we needed. We needed a safe battery. Then people came in and said, well, it's too expensive. That battery is ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000. It makes the car really expensive. Now, that's the way the car companies thought. Here's, here's a car thinker. We have a car. There's no infrastructure. Nobody will ever build the infrastructure. So let's put a bigger battery inside. We cannot do 100 miles. Let's do 200 miles. That's $20,000 battery. Now, I need to put some margin on the battery. So let's make it $25,000. I need to put a warranty on that. Let's put another $5,000. It's a $30,000 battery now. Add it to the car. That's $45,000. Uh, nobody will buy that. So we do small production. Let's make it $55,000. Now we have a $55,000 200-mile car and it stays on the drawing board for another five years. We came in and said, no, you're making a mistake. Separate the battery. Put the battery aside for a second. It's a $10,000 battery, but it, la it lasts for 200,000 miles. Now, that's five cents a mile. Add to it two cents for clean electricity per mile. That's seven cents a mile. Add to it one cent in financing. That's eight cents a mile. Gasoline in Europe is 36 cents a mile. So we have e-gasoline at $0.08 cents versus gasoline at 18 to $0.36. Cents. Now you have a cheaper means of transportation. That separation between the two, the battery and the car, changes the economics drastically. Hence why hybrid plug-ins will go slow and a pure EV with an exchangeable battery will go really, really fast, as fast as almost tipping the industry fairly quickly. Hydrogen is sort of the in-betweener. It is more expensive and it needs infrastructure. Sort of got the worst of both worlds. And the reason is fairly simple. If you go hydrogen, you take an electron and you need to convert it into an atom, which is 2,000 times bigger and heavier than the electron, only to bring it into the car and get the electron back. And in the process, you lose three electrons. So it's the worst way to deliver electrons to a car. 
Hence, it will never become economic. Now, that's the part where we need to really get our heads together because we don't have time to futz around with solutions that don't, don't work. We cannot afford $100 billion subsidies on ethanol if it doesn't scale to give us 365 days worth of oil supply. We cannot put money into fuel cell research if we know that the energy problem is not solved by that. And I'm not saying let's put money into electric vehicles just because I said so. I, said, I think what we need to do is a very quick panel, 100 days, on what works, what doesn't work, and what policy needs to make sure that we go to what works because we don't have time. If there's one thing we ran out of over the last seven, eight years, is time. And so we cannot afford to go do something for 60,000 cars or for five days out of 365 days a year because of this interest group or that. We're beyond interest groups right now. We're running out of a country. We're not realizing it. We're on the Titanic. This is, this is really serious. I know it may sound alarmist, but at $150 a barrel, which might be one hurricane away, it might be one attack in Iraq away, $150 a barrel, our economy and the Chinese economy stop. And you will see both, both sides sending out their armies to secure sources so that we don't get to 200 for them. We cannot afford losing time. On, on clean energy in China, China has got a very interesting model on transportation. So again, start from the social contract of a country. Don't start from the technological question. China is building ring cities. 10 million people, four rings, going outbound. Work is in the middle, living is outside. You drive in and out of the city. Most of the time you don't drive from one city to the next because you need a permit to go from one city to the next. Okay? This is not the, the freedom of transportation we grew accustomed to. Now, you need the cars to go in and out. What you do is ring five. Ring five is the generation ring. Ring five could be solar. Ring five could be wind. Ring five could be anything you want. It could be captured coal, sequestered coal, which is exactly that one cent a mile more expensive than regular coal if they insist on doing coal. And ring five generates the energy required for the cars to go in ring one through four. And the interesting thing about that in China is every one of these cities is an island. Solve for the islands, you solve for the country. So it's actually easier than the US to do China. The hardest one, and that's the one that really worries me, is India. See, in the US, we're plugging in two grids that we already have, the road grid and the electric grid. And they're both in great shape. All we need to do is to connect the last foot. We had to somehow connect the electric grid to the parking spot. In India, you're starting from bad roads and bad electric grid. To solve the problem, you'll need to fix both, and then you need to connect the two infrastructures. And the problem is India is not as aggressive on infrastructure project as China is. India also has now a, an interesting alternative. It's called the Tata Nano. At $2,500, you can buy yourself a car. Now, for the kids who are in Bangalore doing you know, flat worlding at $1,000 a month, for the last three, four, or five years, they've, act, they've amassed capital, they've got cash. And the one appliance they want to buy is not a dishwasher, it's a car. At $2,500, you're going to get a lot of congested roads with cars that have no catalytic converter, no emission standard, nothing. Add that to the world's demand on oil, I don't think we're seeing oil going back to 50 anytime soon. Thank you all very much. So we're going to break for lunch, everybody. We go back through here, bring, grab your lunch box, bring it back. We're going to begin with Morley and Mike in a minute. And, and Shai, by the way, I just want to say good luck. It's really exciting. Thank you again for taking time.